Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the class on pharmacology. In this today's session, let us understand about the cholinergic drugs under ANS pharmacology. Myself, Dr. Padmanabha T.S. So, we are going to understand the cholinergic drugs under these headings. So, here we have acetylcholine introduction. What are the functions of acetylcholine? And also, let us understand the receptors involved in the acetylcholine action and also the cholinergic drugs classification and pharmacological effects of the cholinergic drugs and the indications which are nothing but the uses of the drugs, adverse effects associated with these cholinergic drugs and also the contraindications. So, as you know, acetylcholine is a naturally occurring cholinergic agent. So, why they are called as cholinergic agent? Since choline will be combined with the acetyl-CoA to form a acetylcholine and whenever the acetylcholine acts on the receptors, their receptors are called as cholinergic or muscarine receptors. So, why they are called as muscarine receptors? Since muscarine is alkaloid which acts on the muscarinic receptors. So, that is the name, that is why they are called as the uh, cholinergic receptors or the muscarinic receptors. So, acetylcholine and its muscarinic receptor targets. So, usually muscarinic receptors or muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are present in the peripheral nervous system and are predominantly found in the autonomic effector cells which are innervated by postganglionic parasympathetic nerves. Apart from that, all the preganglionic fibers, preganglionic fibers will going to release the acetylcholine and most of, almost all the uh, autonomic effector cells which are innervated by the postganglionic parasympathetic nerves will have a muscarinic receptor to which acetylcholine will going to act. Apart from that, there is a paradoxical phenomenon where the, even the sympathetic innervations will have cholinergic innervations certain places at certain places like in case of the sweat gland as well as in the blood vessels of the skeletal muscles will also have a cholinergic innervation through the sympathetic plexus. So, alkaloid muscarine will act selectively uh, on the muscarinic receptor similar to that of the effects produced by the acetylcholine which is present in the body. So, that is why they are called as muscarinic actions or parasympathetic actions. So, usually the acetylcholine actions can be called as muscarinic action or cholinergic action as well as the parasympathomimetic actions. So, what is the paradox? So, muscarinic receptors are also present in the autonomic ganglion and on some cells like we discussed earlier, they are also a part of the uh, uh, sympathetic innervations like in case of the sympathetic uh, sweat glands as well as in the uh, blood vessels of the skeletal muscles and also they receive little or no cholinergic innervations. So, muscular receptors in the autonomic ganglions and adrenal medulla primarily functions to modulate the nicotinic actions of the acetylcholine at this site. So, basically the muscular receptor which are present in the autonomic ganglion that is the presynaptic ganglion as well as in the adrenal medulla they modulate the nicotinic actions of the acetylcholine. And in the CNS, they are predominantly present in the hippocampus, cortex and the striatum. They particularly have high density of muscarinic receptors. So, do acetylcholine have any therapeutic value or therapeutic application in clinical practice? The answer is absolutely no. What is the reason for the acetylcholine having no therapeutic application? Because this acetylcholine, uh, when injected into the body, they gets rapidly metabolized or catalyzed by the enzyme called as acetylcholine esterases as well as from the plasma butyrylcholine esterases. So, since the acetylcholine is rapidly metabolized or broken down by the acetylcholine esterases and the butyrylcholine esterases which is present in the plasma its action will be terminated very rapidly. So, the metabolism is very rapid so that acetylcholine concentration 
will not be sufficient for its therapeutic action. And in addition, its penetration to the CNS is limited and the amount of acetyl choline that reaches the peripheral areas with low blood flow is negligible due to the hydrolysis. Due to the breakdown or hydrolysis by the acetyl choline esterases and the plasma butyryl choline esterases. And the muscarinic ag agonist will have an action similar to that of the muscarin receptor mediated effect. That's why they are called as muscarinic agonists. So muscarinic agonist will mimic the muscarinic receptor mediated effects of the acetyl choline. So whichever the agonist you take, muscarinic agonist, they will be acting similar to that of the muscarinic receptor mediated effects which are seen with the acetyl choline. And this muscarinic agonist are typically longer acting congeners of the acetyl choline. As we discussed earlier, acetyl choline is very short acting because of the hydrolysis by the butyryl choline esterase as well as the uh, acetyl choline esterases. And these muscarinic agonists will have a longer acting property. And some of which will also stimulate nicotinic as well as the muscarinic receptors. And some of the drugs will have predominant action on the muscarinic receptors. So all the muscarinic actions of the acetyl choline can be terminated or can be competitively inhibited by a muscarinic antagonist or muscarinic receptor antagonist that is atropine. So atropine is a muscarinic receptor antagonist which can terminate all the effects of muscarinic receptor mediated action produced by acetyl choline. To overcome the nicotinic actions which are in the skeletal muscles, so you need to give a neostigmin which is a cholinesterases inhibitors. So next coming to the muscarinic receptors. So muscarinic receptors, you have five muscarinic receptors. Basically, they are classified into two groups that is M1, M3, M5. Especially the stimulation of M1, M M3, M5 receptor will going to activate GQ coupled receptors and it will going to stimulate the phospholipase activity. Thereby, it brings about the hydrolysis of the phosphatidyl phenocytol by bisphosphate and there will be mobilization of the intracellular calcium. So this mobilization of intracellular calcium will in turn activate the protein kinase C which brings about the cellular response. In contrast to the M1, M3, M5 action, M2, M4 muscarinic receptor will going to inhibit the adenyl cyclase thereby it will going to decrease the cyclic AMP levels. So these will going to regulate the specific ion channels via their coupling to the pertussis toxin sensitive G protein that is GI, G0. So M1, M3, M5 uh, actions are mediated by GQ coupled receptor whereas the M2, M4, M4 receptors actions are mediated by GI that is GI mediated receptors. So nicotinic acetylcholine receptor belongs to inotropic receptors whereas met uh, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors uh, belongs to metabotropic or G protein coupled receptors. So what are the functions of acetylcholine? So acetylcholine has got predominantly main function on the neuromuscular junction which brings about the muscular contraction. In the ANS, they are present all over the preganglionic sites as well as in the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. Exception is the, uh, they can also innervate the sympathetic nerve plexus which are supplied to the sweat glands as well as the blood vessels of the uh, skeletal muscles. And also they play a predominant uh, or primary role in the uh, memory arousal as well as the attention of a humans. So what are the pharmacological effects of acetylcholine? So on the cardiovascular system, it has got predominant effect. It has got four actions. So which are those four actions? Since we discuss in the skeletal muscles, it causes, uh, it, it, it acts on the blood vessels. It can cause vasodilation. So apart from that, in the heart itself per se, it will going to decrease all the activity. It decreases the heart rate. So it has got negative coronotropic action. It decreases the conduction velocity by acting on the AV node. It has, so thereby it has got negative dromotropic action and also it decreases the force of cardiac contraction. Thereby it has got negative inotropic action. So it has got negative chronotropic action, negative dromotropic action and negative inotropic action. So all this negative inotropic effect 
is of lesser significance in case of ventricles than in the atria. So, coming to the effect of acetylcholine on blood vessels. So, whenever you give an intravenous injection of small dose of acetylcholine, what it produces? There will be transient fall in the blood pressure. So, initially there is a transient fall in the blood pressure. The reason being it produces vasodilation. So, there will be generalized vasodilation which will be mediated by the vascular endothelial nitric oxide because of the release of the nitric oxide from the endothelial cells, it causes a relaxation of the vascular smooth muscles leading to the vasodilation and fall in the blood pressure which is responsible for again the reflex tachycardia. And since acetylcholine produces generalized vasodilation, let us understand its uh, uh, the mechanism involved in vasodilation. So, this generalized vasodilation is mainly due to the exogenous due to the exogenously administered acetylcholine and it will be going to stimulate the muscarinic receptor. So, which receptor is stimulated? So, M3 receptor is stimulated which is present on the vascular endothelial cells which in turn activates the GQ coupled receptor thereby it leads to activation of the phospholipase C pathway thereby it will going to release the anesterol triphosphate. So, it is GQ phospholipase C anesterol triphosphate pathway leading to the release of the uh, calcium as well as it leads to the calcium calmodulin dependent activation of the endothelial endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So, this endothelial nitric oxide synthase will going to produce the nitric oxide in other words nitric oxide released here it is also called as endothelial derived relaxing factor that is ADRF which is responsible for diffusion into the uh, adjacent vascular smooth muscles leading to the stimulation of the guanyl cyclase and there will be increase in the cyclic GMP levels. As you know that cyclic GMP being the secondary messenger, the cyclic GMP will going to promote the vascular smooth muscle relaxation which is responsible for the vasodilation and fall in blood pressure. On the other hand, vagal stimulation on the coronary vessels, so what you are going to see? So, baroreceptor or chemoreceptor reflexes or direct stimulation of the vagus will lead to parasympathetic coronary vasodilation which are mediated by the acetylcholine and consequently because of the production of nitric oxide from the endothelial. So, whenever there is a endothelial is intact, so what will happen to the response? So, there will be coronary vasodilation, there will be vasodilation and there is a fall in blood pressure. So, what happens whenever there is a uh, 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 damage to the endothelial cells. So, whenever there is vascular endothelial cells are damaged, so what will happen is since it is a pathological condition, acetylcholine will going to act predominantly on the M3 receptor which are present on the vascular smooth muscles. To produce vasodilation, it should act on the M3 receptor present on the endothelial cells. Since the endothelium is damaged, M3 receptor in the vascular smooth muscle get directly stimulated leading to the vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction. So, acetylcholine has got dual property with respect to the blood vessel action. So, acetylcholine can cause vasodilation as well as the vasoconstriction. So, whenever it acts on M3 receptor, whenever it stimulates the M3 receptor which is present in the vascular endothelial cells, it activates the GQ PLC IP3 pathway leading to calcium calmodulin dependent activation of endothelial uh, nitric oxide synthase enzyme which will going to in turn produce the nitric oxide which is the EDRF and it gets diffuses into the adjacent vascular smooth muscles and leading to increase in the cyclic GMP level because of the stimulation of the guanyl cyclase. So, this increased cyclic GMP is responsible for the relaxation of the vascular smooth muscles leading to vasodilation. On the other hand, if the endothelium is damaged, so, acetylcholine will going to stimulate the M3 receptor in the vascular smooth muscles. Again, it will going to increase the calcium levels in the cells. There will be elevation of the intracellular calcium levels. So, thereby it leads to vascular smooth muscle contraction leading to vasoconstriction and rise in blood pressure. So, acetylcholine whenever you administer at initially it will going to cause fall in uh, the blood pressure and in later there will be increase in the blood pressure etc. So, what will be the effect of acetylcholine on the myocardium or the cardiac cells? So, as we discussed earlier, so 
in the myocardium the predominant uh, muscarinic receptor which is present is m2 receptors so m2 receptor stimulation will lead to activation of gi coupled receptor so that is gi that is inhibitory type of receptor so gi mediated decrease in the cyclic amp levels so thereby it depress, depresses the activity of the cardiac function so thereby it causes negative chronotropic action negative dromotropic action and negative inotropic action so opposite response will occur so whenever there is a even in the uh, heart there is a predominant beta 1 adrenergic receptor activation of beta 1 will lead to stimulation of gs mediated increase in cyclic amp leading to increase in the heart rate whereas in case of the acetylcholine whenever you give a acetylcholine so m2 receptor will stimulate and it depresses the cardiac function so basically two things you should remember so whenever acetylcholine is given it will going to decrease the heart rate it causes bradycardia so whenever you stimulate the beta 1 receptor by the adrenergic adrenergic neurons or or the catecholamines so beta 1 stimulation will lead to increase in the heart rate whereas m2 receptor stimulation will lead to decrease in the heart rate that is bradycardia so m2 stim uh, stimulation will lead to bradycardia beta 1 stimulation will lead to tachycardia and coming to the acetylcholine effects on sympathetic nerve terminals so as you know that parasympathetic postganglionic nerve terminals will going to release acetylcholine and release acetylcholine will act or can act on the presynaptic m2 receptors so if it acts on the presynaptic m2 receptors in the parasympathetic uh, nerve terminals it will going to inhibit the further release of the acetylcholine release from the parasympathetic postganglionic nerve terminals in the human heart so this is the reason why it will going to decrease the effect of the acetylcholine on the heart. If acetylcholine acts on the presynaptic M2 receptor, it will going to decrease the acetylcholine release. Release acetylcholine can also act on the presynaptic M2 M3 receptor, which is present in the adjacent sympathetic nerve terminals. Thereby, it also inhibits the release of norepinephrine from the adrenergic nerve terminals. So what happens if acetylcholine acts at the SA node? So at the SA node, as you know that each normal cardiac impulse is initiated, there will be spontaneous depolarization of the pacemaker cells. At a critical level, when a threshold is reached, a threshold potential is reached, this depolarization will get initiated and it leads to generation of the action potential. So acetylcholine slows the heart rate primarily by decreasing the rate of spontaneous depolarization and attainment of the threshold potential. So normally there will be threshold potential is reached and there will be depolarization which is which is required for the action potential generation. So here the acetylcholine slows down the heart rate by decreasing the depolarization. In the atria acetylcholine will cause hyperpolarization and decreases the action potential duration as well as the conduction. And what happens to the acetylcholine in the AV node? In the AV node, acetylcholine slows the conduction and increases the refractory period. So this decremental effect in the AV nodal conduction is responsible for complete heart block. So what happens when acetylcholine acts at the Purkinje fibers? So this acetylcholine has got modest negative inotropic effect in the ventricles. So the automaticity of Purkinje fiber is suppressed and also threshold for ventricular fibrillation will be increased. So thereby it decreases the contraction, conduction as well as the, the cardiac activity. So what happens to the when acetylcholine reaches and acts on the respiratory tract? So as you know that it is a parasympathomimetic drug parasympathetic response will cause bronchoconstriction in the bronchial smooth muscles. So this acetylcholine will going to act on the M3 receptor which is present on the bronchial smooth muscles as well as tracheal smooth muscles leading to the bronchospasm that is bronchoconstriction and there will be tracheobronchial secretion and also there will be a, a trigger or stimulation of the chemoreceptors of the carotid as well as the aortic bodies. So thereby acetylcholine will be a dangerous a uh, 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 neurotransmitter in case of the bronchial asthma patients. So externally also if you are giving any uh, cholinergic drugs you should be very careful and it, it becomes the contraindication for use in case of bronchial asthma 
patients. And what happens whenever you give a, a cell choline in case of urinary tract? So the response that to track the response of the acetyl choline in the urinary tract as well as the GI tract, it is very, very difficult because of their poor perfusion into the visceral organs and also they get rapidly metabolized by the plasma butyryl choline esterases or, or the plasma butyryl choline esterases are also called as pseudo choline esterases. So as you can see here, whenever, uh, as you know that parasympathetic innervation comes from the sacral innervation, cervico sacral innervation. So it will going to stimulate the detrusor muscles as well as it will going to stimulate the muscles in the ureter. So there will be detrusor muscle contraction and ureter muscle contraction leading to the increased widening pressure. So detrusor muscles of the urinary bladder gets contracted that will going to cause contraction of the urinary bladder and there will be passage of the urine. So there will be widening of the urine. So there will be increase in the widening pressure. And on the other hand, it also increases the ureteral muscle uh, spasm or contraction leading to ureteral peristalsis. So again, which is res which, which uh, receptor is uh, responsible here? Again, M3 receptors are predominantly present in the detrusor smooth muscle leading to the bladder contraction, bladder contraction. So what is the effect of acetylcholine on the GI tract? So as you know that this acetylcholine will also going to increase the contraction as well as secretory capacity through the M3 receptors in the gastrointestinal tract. So again, acetylcholine will going to increase the secretory activity in the stomach as well as intestine and also it will going to increase the J tract tone by increasing the J smooth muscle contraction. So which will lead to increasing GI motility as well as the amplitude of contraction will be increased, the GI motility will be increased. So again the response is not seen very predominantly because of their uh, very difficult to measure because uh, of the rapid degradation by the plasma butyl choline esterases. So what happens to the secretory effects when you give a acetyl choline? So acetyl choline because of the parasympathetic innervation and some of the uh, 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 glands like salivary gland will also have a uh, sympathetic cholinergic innervation which is responsible for stimulation of the glands which will lead to secretory action. So whenever acetyl choline acts on the gland it stimulates the glandular function. Again in the glands you have M3 receptor which is responsible for increase in the secretion. There will be increased lacrimal secretion, there can be increased nasopharyngeal secretion, there will be increase in the salivary secretion as well as the sweat glands. So what is the effect of acetyl choline on the eye? So this acetyl choline will going to act from the circular muscle fibers which is also called as pinter pupillae. So thereby it causes contraction. So again which is the resp receptor responsible for the, the contraction of the circular muscles? On the circular muscles you have got M3 receptor which is responsible for meiosis that is constriction of the pupil. Pupil size will be reduced. On the other hand even the M3 receptors are present on the ciliary muscles. So ciliary muscles of the iris and it will lead to the accommodation, accommodation. So whenever you give a atropin, what will happen? So there will be loss of accommodation. So the person will not be able to accommodate for the near vision. So atropin when you give, there is a passive mitriasis, passive mitriasis. So whenever you give acetylcholine, what happens to the pupil size? There will be decrease in the pupil size, that is meiosis, that is the pupil size will be reduced. So what is the effect of acetylcholine on the CNS? So the effect of the uh, acetylcholine on the CNS is it improves the cognitive function. So major role of acetylcholine is to increase the cognitive function, to control the motor uh, uh, functions, to appetite regulation and nociception. Whenever uh, you administer acetylcholine systematic, systematically, acetylcholine has limited CNS penetration. And uh, these muscarinic agonists can cross blood brain barrier and can evoke the cortical arousal or activation of response similar to that produced by injection of the choline esterase inhibitor that is like the uh, physostigmine or similar to that of the electrical stimulation of the brainstem reticular formation. So coming to the muscarinic receptor agonist. So muscarinic receptor agonist can be classified into direct drugs and indirect drugs. So whatever you, you are seeing in this slide is the direct muscarinic 
agonist or direct cholinergic drugs. So again, they are classified into cholinesters and those drugs uh, which are procured from naturally or they are called as alkalis. So cholinesters, we have acetylcholine, methacholine, carbacol and bethanacol. Whereas naturally occurring cholinomimetic agents are called as alkaloids, we have pilocarpine, muscarine and aracholine. So coming to the individual functions. So methacholine is a beta methyl analog of acetylcholine. It has got greater duration of action as well as selectivity. Because of the methyl group, it has got increased duration of action and increased selectivity towards the muscarinic receptor. So this methyl group increases its resistance to hydrolysis by decholinesterases. So cholinesterase is responsible for breakdown of the methyl methacholine and because of the methyl group, its breakdown will be reduced. Because of the reduced metabolism, what happens? There is an increased duration of action. So it can act for longer duration of action. And it has got predominant action on the muscarinic, muscarinic receptors in the cardiovascular system, cardiovascular system. And carbacol and its methyl analog, that is methanacol, can also act predominantly on the nicotinic receptors. So bethanacol as uh, can also act on muscarinic receptor as well. But when you compare the, the predominance of action with respect to the bethanacol, bethanacol predominantly acts on the muscarinic receptors compared to the nicotinic receptors. Almost all this methacholine, carbacol has got longer duration of action. The reason being they are almost completely resistant to hydrolysis by the choline esterases. Thereby, the T off of these drugs will going to prolong. Again, the bethanocol, they have got predominant action on the muscarinic uh, uh, receptors, basically on the, uh, which are present in the GI tract as well as the urinary bladder. So coming to the major natural alkaloids, that is the muscarinic agonist, which are derived from the natural alkaloids. You have muscarin, muscarin, phylocarpine and aracholine. So muscarin exclusively acts on the muscarinic receptor whereas well, pilocarpine has got predominant effect on the muscarinic receptors. So aracholine has got both actions on the nicotinic as well as the muscarinic receptors. So pilocarpine importance is they can be used as a meiotic agent that is the drug which can decrease the pupil size and also for silogog property. Silogog property means it will going to increase the secretion, salivary secretions. So it can be used in conditions where there is a dry mouth, dry eye, etc. So coming to the the pharmacokinetic parameters that is the absorption, distribution, metabolism and the excretion. So muscarin and cholinesterase belongs to quaternary amines. So thereby it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Whereas the tertiary amines, the pilocarpine and aracholine can cross blood-brain barriers because of their lipid solubility. And natural alkaloids get excreted primarily by the kidney whereas the tertiary amines can be excreted by the kidney and its uh, excretion can be accelerated by acidification of the urine. So coming to the therapeutic advantages or therapeutic uses of the muscarinic agonist. So what are the therapeutic advantages or therapeutic uses of cholinergic drugs? So cholinergic agonists, they are basically used in the treatment of urinary bladder disorders. They can be used in case of urinary bladder disorders means whenever there is a urinary retention, these drugs will going to contract the bladder smooth muscle, thereby it will going to co cause voiding of the urine. It can be used in xerostomia, that is dry mouth, diagnosis of bronchial hyperactivity through bronchoprovocation test. This has to be done very carefully, but these activity, that is bronchial hyperactivity diagnosis is absolute now. They are not used in clinical practice now. And also they are useful uh, as a meiotic agent along with mitriatic, along with mitriatic they are used to break down the additions, additions and also to counteract the mitriatic effect you can use meiotic agent. And also this muscarine drugs are useful in case of glaucoma since the pupil gets constricted the iridocorneal angle will be will be widened thereby leading to the increased drainage of the aqueous humor thereby we are going to decrease the intraocular pressure which will be very very helpful in case of glaucoma. And acetylcholine as we discussed earlier also, please remember acetylcholine is not used clinically. The reason being acetylcholine, if you administer, it gets rapidly degraded or rapidly hydrolyzed by the enzyme called as acetylcholinesterases as well as 
from the plasma butyl choline esterases. And the textbook mentions that they can be used for induction of neonosis during ophthalmological surgeries. So coming to the individual drug that is methacholine. Methacholine is a cholinergic drug. It can be administered through inhalation loop. It is used for diagnosis of the bronchial airway hyperactivity, especially in patients who do not have any clinically apparent asthma, but do not use in asthma patient, but in case of those who do not have clinical apparent asthma. But all this uh, 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 trials were done previously and please do not take risk and these action or use is absolute now, they are not used in clinical practice. So previously what they used to do is to check the bronchial airway hyperactivity, they used to use methacholine inhalation along with they used to keep an emergency restoration equipment like oxygen and the beta 2 agonist to cause bronchodilation. So whenever you give methacholine as you know it acts on MP receptors in the bronchial smooth muscles and the tracheobronchial tree leading to the bronchoconstriction and increased bronchotracheal secretions. So methacholine is contraindicated in case of if the patient has got any previous severe airway flow limitation, recent myocardial infarction, any stroke or uncontrolled hypertension as well as in case of pregnancy. So next coming to the bethana call. So B stands for B, B stands for bladder, B stands for bowel. So it is useful in bladder contraction as well as bowel contraction. So bladder means urinary tract. So it is used to treat the urinary retention and inadequate emptying of the bladder when, when organic obstruction is absent. So they are useful in the treatment of post-operative urinary retention, diabetic autonomic neuropathy, chronic hypotonic or myogenic or neurogenic bladder. And on the other hand, uh, bethanocol that is bowel, it will going to increase the peristalsis, increase the motility, it increase the resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Therefore, it can be used in case of post-operative abdominal distension, in case of a gastric atony, gastroparesis, as well as uh, paralytic ileus, as well as in case of the gastroesophageal reflex. So, what is carbocol? Carbocol can be used topically in ophthalmology for the treatment of glaucoma and also for induction of meiosis in case of during ophthalmological surgeries. So, coming to the pilocarpine, very important drug. Please remember, pilocarpine, they act on M3 receptor and the salivary gland can cause zero can be used in case of xerostomy as a cellogog agent as it will going to increase the secretion. So they are useful in xerostomia following the head and neck radiation. Xerostomy associated with Jogron syndrome which is an autoimmune disorder particularly occurring in case of females and there will be, uh, there'll be secretions particularly there will be increased secretion in the salivary and lacrimal glands. They can be used in glaucoma as we discussed earlier and also as a meiotic agent. Only side effect concern is it is the most common side effect will be the sweating. So the recent drug, very new drug, semimelon, again a muscarinic agonist, it acts similar to that of phylocarpine, but advantage is it has got longer action. So it is a long acting, long lasting cellogogic action on the lacrimal as well as the salivary gland, which can also be used in the treatment of xerostomia in case of Jogron syndrome. And again, it will going to activate particularly M3 receptors. So what are the contraindications and precautions and adverse effects you need to take care of? So contraindications for the use of muscarinic agonist is asthma, bronchial asthma patient, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, urinary tract obstruction, peptic ulcer disease because these drugs will going to increase the secretion by acting on the M1 receptor present in the gastrointestinal tract thereby it leads to increase HCL secretion. And also in case of cardiovascular disease accompanied by bradycardia and hypotension. Since it causes initial hypotension and also it has got cardiac depressant activity, you should be very, very careful. And also in case of hyperthyroidism, muscarinic agonist may precipitate atrial fibrillation in hyperthyroid patients. So what are the adverse effects? So most common adverse effects will be the increased secretion, diarrhea, urination, abdominal cramp, GI related side effect. There will be visual disturbances hypotension and there can be severely reduction in the coronary blood flow. So what will happen to these effects whenever you give to topical route? So these side effects will be very, very minimal or limited whenever you give this drug to topical administration for ophthalmic use. So coming to the toxicology, so whenever there is a poisoning due to these drugs like pilocarpine muscarin or anything, so that means there will be exaggeration of the parasympathomimetic actions. 
So when means the cholinergic activity will be more or a muscarinic activity will be more. So you need to go for an antagonist. That is, you have atropine, which is a drug of choice for any parasympathomimetic related exaggerated effects. And also you need to take care of respiration, uh, cardiovascular symptoms, and you need to counteract the bronchial edema. So coming to the one more drug, that is, till now we talked about the direct cholinergic drugs. Now we are moving towards the indirectly acting cholinergic drug. They are also called as acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So here you need to understand whenever you give a cholinergic drug, it will act similar to that of acetylcholine. So acetylcholine gets degraded or broken down by the acetylcholinesterases. So when you give acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, the enzyme activity will be decreased and acetylcholine levels will be more in the body. It will going to stay in the body for a prolonged duration. So directly it can act on muscarinic receptor, that is the direct cholinergic drug, indirect acting cholinergic drugs are the one which is going to inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzyme activity, thereby it prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine, thereby it will going to increase the levels of the acetylcholine concentration in the body. So we have a reversible classification of acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, we have reversible inhibitors and the irreversible inhibitors. Under reversible, we have got tertiary amines, that is physostigmine, donepezil, rivastigmine, galantamine and tacrine. And quaternary amines, you have got neostigmine, pyridostigmine and the hydrophonium. So tertiary amine can cross blood-brain barrier, whereas quaternary amines will be confined to the peripheral action. Whereas the irreversible, we have carbamate, organophosphate compounds and only theo, ecotheophate among irreversible inhibitor is used clinically. Uh, uh, clinically in case of treatment of glaucoma, whereas carbamate and organophosphorate are very, very toxic compounds. So this is the classification of the, of the reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So what are the therapeutic uses? So if you ask about the, the pharmacological actions, the pharmacological actions of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are similar to that of the acetylcholine or directly acting sympathomimetic, directly acting cholinergic drugs. So pharmacological action will remain same. So what are the therapeutic uses of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors? So they are useful in the treatment of atony of smooth muscles related to in intestinal tract, that is in case of paralytic ileus or in case of atonic bladder. In case of glaucoma, you can use the drops. In case of myasthenia gravis, Alzheimer's disease and reversal of the or paralysis, reversal of paralysis or competitive neuromuscular blocking drugs. So coming to the individual uses. So it, neostigmine can be used in the treatment of paralytic ileus as well as in the ato, atony of the urinary bladder. So you can use uh, drugs like physostigmine to treat the narrow angle glaucoma or in case of acute congestive glaucoma. So pyridoxin, uh, pyridostigmine, neostigmine, are the drugs which are useful in the treatment of myasthenia gravis, which will going to improve the muscle strength. So what is hydrophonium? Hydrophonium is a short acting uh, anticholinesterase inhibitor. This drug is used to test whether the person has got myasthenic crisis or cholinergic crisis. When you give a hydrophonium, it will act for short duration of time and there will be improvement in the muscle strength if the patient has got myasthenia gravis. If the patient has got cholinergic crisis, what will happen? The patient will, will going to experience the weakening or worsening of the muscle, muscles. And remember, when compared to neostigmine, pyridostigmine is a longer acting drug, longer acting drug. Coming to the Alzheimer's disease, again, a, uh, again, an autoimmune disorder which uh, related to the cognition. So there will be loss of memory. And again, cholinergic, uh, uh, as you know that, Cholinergic innervations are responsible for cognition and memory. So you need to increase the acetylcholine levels. So this will be done by the drugs like donepezil, galantamine and rivastigmine that the drug of choice for Alzheimer's disease. So how do you treat the intoxication by anticholinergic drugs? So any intoxication by anticholinergic drugs that is the centrally or whether it is centrally or peripherally anticholinergic activity that is atropine, phenothiazines, antihistaminics, bicyclic antidepressants, all this group of drugs will have anticholinergic activity. So this toxicity can be overcome by giving 
or anti coldness rays that is physostigmine so physostigmine can be uh, they are uh, they are able to reverse the central anticholinergic syndrome so what is the drug of choice for atropine poisoning so atropine overdose the drug of choice will be your physostigmine which is a anti uh, which is a cholinesterases inhibitors so again the cholinergic agents uh, can be classified coming to the summary cholinergic agents can be classified into directly acting and indirectly acting cholinergic agent directly acting cholinergic agent we have naturally available drugs that is the alkaloids we have uh, the uh, stelcholine pilocarpine muscarine and aracrolin under the esters mainly we have acetylcholine and the acetylcholine uh, containers which are the esters choline esters we have carbacol methacholine and methanacol and are indirectly acting these drugs will going to inhibit the choline stress activity we have reversible we have tertiary amines like pyrostigmine done fizzel rivastigmine and galantamine and tacrine quaternary amines which are water soluble we have neostigmine pyrostigmine and hydrofonium please do not confuse which can cause blood brain barrier only the pyrostigmine can cause blood brain barrier but not the neostigmine and pyrostigmine they are pertain to the peripheral action so irreversible uh, inhibitors irreversible uh, cholinesterase inhibitors are carbamate and organophosphate compounds and eco-theophate so coming to the uses acetylcholine has got no clinical use pilocarpine can be used as neotic agent in case of glaucoma and xerostomia due to radiation as well as in case of Bjorgren syndrome esters cholinesters carbacol it can be used in case of glaucoma methacholine previously used for bronchial hyperactivity testing but not used nowadays Bethanocol, two, two Bs as to remember, bowel contraction and bladder contraction. So, that can be useful in case of ignorant retention and paralytic ileus, especially in case of post-operative neurogenic paralytic ileus. So, reversible cholinesterase inhibitor, physostigmine is useful in glaucoma and in case of Alzheimer's, you will be using donapazil, rivastigmine and galantamine. And for myasthenia gravis, you will be using neostigmine and pyridostigmine. Apart from myasthenia gravis, neostigmine can also be used in treatment of paralytic ileus and atonia, atonia of urinary bladder. And hydrofenium is used for diagnosis of the myasthenia gravis. And under irreversible cholinesterase inhibitor, carbamates and organophosphate compounds are never used because of their toxicity and ecotheophate are used in case of glaucoma. So, which is the drug of choice for the carbamate and OP compound poisoning? So, since carbamate and OP compound will have similar to that of acetylcholinergic uh, symptoms, whenever you give a acetylcholine overdose occurs. So, you will also see the similar side effects of cholinergic toxicity in case of carbamate and organophosphate compound poisoning. In such cases, the drug of choice will be the atropine. So, for OP compound poisoning, drug of choice is atropine. Carbamate poisoning, drug of choice is atropine. But since carbamate binds to the acetylcholinesterase uh, enzyme, uh, in the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, there are two sites, estric and the anionic site. So, both the sites will be occupied by the carbamate. We will not be able to reactivate. So, to reactivate the enzyme, we can give pralidoxime. So, pralidoxime is not useful in case of carbamate because both estric and anionic site will be bound by the carbamate. Whereas, in organophosphate, only estric site will be bound and anionic site will be vacant. So, the oxygens can bind to the anionic site and it will form a covalent bond with the phosphate group of the organophosphate leading to the dissociation of the organophosphate come from the acetylcholinesterase thereby it will lead to it will lead to activation reactivation of the acetylcholine esterases that is it prevents the enzyme from going for aging so aging of the enzyme will be prevented and coming to the cholinergic side effects, this can be remembered in the form of mnemonic. So, muscarinic uh, side effects can be remembered in the form of dumbbells. So, D5 it causes diarrhea, urination, neosis that is constriction of the pupil, bronchoria, bronchospasm, bronchoconstriction, there will be emesis, lacrimation and laxation that is defecation and sweating and salivation. Nicotinic stimulation can cause tachycardia, high blood pressure, muscle fasciculation, paralysis, uh, of respiratory muscle in case of severe conditions. So, coming to the sum summary, in this class we talked about the what is acetylcholine, what are the receptors involved in the acetylcholine functions and oh, what are the important functions of acetylcholine. We also discussed about whether acetylcholine is used clinically or not. 
we understood about the cholinergic drug classification, it can be classified into direct as well as the indirect. We talked about the pharmacological actions, the pharmacological actions of direct and indirect remain same and we talked about the indications and the uses, what are the adverse effects and the contraindications, contraindications and especially the acetylcholine action on the neuromuscular junction will be studied in the other class where you will, where we are going to discuss about the how acetylcholine will going to act on the neuromuscular junction, neuromuscular junction about the what are the uses of the acetylcholine when it acts on the neuromuscular junction. Thank you.